suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by his death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints That history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope ruled the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. My name's Tom Fress, and you're listening to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. And I am privileged and blessed and honored to be here to continue our reading and discussion of this most magnificent Protestant work, a book that reveals the apostasy of Christianity today. It's called Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. And for continuity purposes, I'm going to retreat to the bottom of page 166, if you're following along in the reading. And I'm going to read the last full paragraph that we ended with the last time we were together, which was, I believe, about two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, because of internet hackers. As far as we can tell, Someone is hacking, so we can't continue this discussion, but we're on the air to live tonight, and I'm going to back up one paragraph and pick up where we left off. We're going to talk about the Inquisition tonight, and then following our regular routine, I'm going to read out of this book for an hour, and then I'm going to take a a short five-minute recess to get a drink, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to discuss with you an experience that I had this afternoon, a wonderful experience that I had this afternoon. God opened the eyes of a of an infidel, a man who had never been churched all his life, and he wanted to know from me what the new world order is. And when I told him, I saw his face light up. He got it a man who was perfectly ignorant in the scriptures got it. It was a wonderful experience for me, and I want to share it with the listeners. So I'll begin now, the bottom of page 166, Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. Before I read, I'll just recap briefly. Henry Grattan Guinness has just proven beyond any credible doubt, beyond any argument, that the papacy and the papacy alone is the Antichrist of the Bible. The biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist of the Bible is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. And the Protestant reformers who built the Protestant Reformation and liberated all of Europe 
with the single knowledge that the papacy was the Antichrist of the Bible, they were correct. And that is what is so sorely lacking in the churches today. That single knowledge that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible. And then I'm going to talk about the consequences of that error in the, in the discussion period after the reading of this book. Now, I'll begin the reading. We're going to talk about the Inquisition. Remember, Henry Grattan Guinness is giving a lecture, and this is a written <clears throat> This book constitutes a written reflection of, of what that lecture contained. Now, here he is lecturing to a group of people that had filled the, the building that they were in and was spilled out into the streets, okay? He says, this book is Limborch's History of the Inquisition. He's holding up a book, if you can imagine this. This is real time. This is what he was doing. He was holding up a book of Limborch's History of the Inquisition. And he says, it tells a story of its origin 700 years ago. Now, remember, this book was written in about 1870-ish, somewhere in there, 1876, I believe. He says... This book, Limborch's History of the Inquisition, tells the story of its origin 700 years ago and of its establishment and progress in France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Poland, Sicily, Sardinia, Germany, Holland, and other parts of the world. It describes its ministers and methods, its vicars, assistants, notaries, judges, and other officials. Remember, the Inquisition was called at that time the Holy Office of the Inquisition. Today it's called the Congregation for the Preservation of the Doctrine of the Faith. Pope Benedict XVI was the head, the prefect of the what was once known, what was once called, the Holy Office of the Inquisition. They called it the Holy Office because they killed Protestants. That's why they called it the Holy Office, because they killed God's true people, Bible-believing Christians who would never bend the knee to the Pope, okay? The Antichrist, the, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. And this Inquisition dominated all the Catholic countries of the world. And they made their business of interrogation, torture, and murder of, of what they called heretics, true Bible-believing Christians. Okay, this book, this Limborch's History of the Inquisition, describes its ministers and its methods. Okay? You want, to, you want to find out how Rome killed true, Bible-believing, God-fearing, body of Christ Christians? Read Limborch's History of the Inquisition. Now, some people have asked, well, if I'm initi you know, initiating discussions with members of my family, and I want them to get to understand what the old world order is so that they can understand what the new world order is, since the new world order is just the reestablishment of the old world order. What book is, is, is Romanism and the Reformation the best book that I can give them, or should I give them something else to prepare them for Romanism and the Reformation? This would be a good one. Limborch's History of the Inquisition, and also Fox's Book of Martyrs. There are many, many, many Protestant books that are rare and hard to find, but they're still around. Some of them have even been uploaded on the internet. You can read them for free right online, okay? Protestant books that describe the old world order and what role the papacy played in persecuting and killing God's people with a, a, a huge, organized, systematic method 
to destroy God's people called the Inquisition or the Holy Office. Limborch's history of the Inquisition describes the Inquisition's ministers and methods, its vicars, assistants, notaries, judges. I want you to know the judges today that wear the black robes that sit behind the benches, they still serve the same role. And they will more and more serve the same role as the judges of the Holy Office of the Inquisition, as this new world order continues. It describes its vicars, assistants, notaries, judges, and other officials. I mean, just tell you flat out, government officials. National, federal, state, county, and municipal officials are all controlled by the Vatican. It describes the power of the the inquisitors and their manner of proceeding. It unveils their dreadful tribunal, opens their blood-stained records, describes their dungeons, the secret tortures they inflicted, the extreme, merciless, unmitigated tortures and also the public so-called acts of faith. They were called auto de fe, autos de fe, act of faith. It's French for acts of faith. And what those were, were public burnings of heretics, Bible-believing Christians. Henry Gratton Guinness continues, he says, what a record. What a world of tyranny and intolerable anguish compressed into that one word, the Inquisition. Tyranny over the conscience. Men in the name of Jesus Christ stretching and straining, maiming and mangling their fellow men to compel them to call light darkness and darkness light. In other words, to call the Pope the vicar of Christ, instead of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist that he is, to compel men to call light darkness and darkness light, to call the gospel of Jesus Christ a lie and the lie of Satan or his vicar on earth, the papacy, truth to confess that wrong is right and acknowledge right as wrong, to bow down to a man and worship him as God, to call the teachings of Christ heresy and the teachings of Antichrist or the teachings of the papacy divine. Tremendous was the power of that dread tribunal In Spain and Portugal, it completely crushed the Protestant Reformation. No secrets could be withheld from the inquisitors. Hundreds of persons were often apprehended in one day, and in consequence of information resulting from their examinations and tortures, thousands were apprehended. Thousands were apprehended. Let me just tell you, there may have been thousands apprehended in just one small area. Those who have suffered under the tortures of the holy office of the Inquisition total hundreds of millions. Yes, there are records that say that there were only 50 million, but that was the Spanish Inquisition alone. We just named the other places where the Inquisition took place, and it was all of Southern Europe, Roman Catholic Southern Europe, and Protestantism was not tolerated. 
God's people by the hundreds of millions have been killed by Rome over the last thousand years. Do you suppose that Rome has changed? Did did Rome get Jesus somehow? Or is she only beginning to kill? Henry Gratton Guinness continues, he says, prisons, convents, even private homes were crowded with victims. The cells of the Inquisition were filled and emptied again and again. Its torture chamber was a hell. The most excruciating engines were employed to dislocate the limbs of even tender women. Yes, I want to stop and make sure you understand what I just read to you. He says, again, the most excruciating engines or apparatuses, apparati, were employed to dislocate the limbs of even tender women. Let me tell you, I've got a full, a huge book. It must be 24 inches wide by at least that tall of glossy portrait quality photographs of the engines of persecution devised by Rome to torture Protestants. They're still in existence in museums around the world, and you can pay to see these things, and I've got a book with photographs of actual instruments and elaborate machinery developed and manufactured to torture God's people, to dislocate their limbs. You know they had apparatuses that they could lock onto a man's knee and completely separate the, lo- the knee from, from his thigh, dislocate thumbs, break their backs, all to get them to bow down to the Pope, the Antichrist of the Bible. He says the most excruciating engines were employed to dislocate the limbs of even tender women. Thousands were burned at the stake. The gospel was gagged and crushed, and Christ himself in in the person of his members subjected to the anguish of a second Golgotha. God's true people throughout the centuries were subject to the same kinds of anguish that Christ suffered on the cross. They never taught you that in school, did they? They never taught you that in college, did they? They didn't teach you in the seminary, did they? Hundreds of millions of God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians who knew that the papacy was the antichrist of Scripture, who would never bend the knee to the Pope, who would never obey a government that was run by the papacy, were tortured in like manner as our own Messiah on Golgotha's hill. Now, those who call themselves Christians today who believe in a future Antichrist, and Antichrist is, well, he hasn't come yet, are looking for a seven-year period of great tribulation, and they have no concept that Rome has killed God's people without restraint, uncontrolled uninterrupted continuously for nearly 1,800 years. Do you have any conception that the wars of the world are fought to reduce heretical nations, that is, nations who will not submit to the authority of the Pope to destroy them and to get control of them? Do you realize that the government of the United States, the most powerful military force in the world, wages all of its wars not to protect the sovereignty of this nation or our Constitution or our Protestant liberties, but to destroy them? 
and to bring every other nation of the world to abeyance of the papacy. Let me tell you, the new world order is simply the old world order restored. The inquisition that we're talking about right now, these engines that were employed to dislocate the limbs of even tender women, still exist today in the, in, in the form of smart bombs, space-based laser weaponry. When Rome is ready to do what she is fully prepared to do, what she has worked for 1,800 years to do, is to push a button, energize a laser in space, and just vaporize the heretics. There's no need for a circuit of priests wearing black robes, carrying trailer loads of torture instruments to go from town to town to kill God's people. No, they can just simply push a button and smoke God's people. That would be an auto de fe, wouldn't it? High-tech inquisition. That's where we're headed. Because we've forgotten our Protestant roots. We've forgotten who the Antichrist is. We think the Pope is the, well, well, he's the spiritual leader of the world. And he's the harbinger. He's the, he, he is the proponent of human rights. Listen, from the papacy's point of view, hey, you have one right and one right only. And that's to bow down and worship him. That's what Henry Gratton Guinness is telling you in this book. This is Protestantism, and you won't hear about it in the churches today because they're all apostate. They'll teach you about a future Antichrist. Oh, is it Barack Obama? Is it Rampy from Europe? Well, is it Benjamin Netanyahu? Who is the Antichrist? Has he come yet? Will he come in the future? I wonder who it'll be. They spend all their time talking about an antichrist that they don't believe they'll ever witness in their lives because they're going to be ka-ching, raptured right out of here. It's all a lie, baby. It's all a lie. We've been lied to for generations, and Henry Grattan Guinness is bringing back to you a taste of real Bible-believing Protestantism. You want to talk about seven years of great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time and nor ever shall be? Maybe you ought to find out what the Inquisition was like in, the, in history. You'll get a glimpse, just a glimpse of the tortures that Rome has in store for us today. Henry Grattan Guinness continues. He says, let's look into the chamber of horrors in the Spanish Inquisition. Now, we're talking about just the Spanish Inquisition here. Quote, the place of torture, unquote, says a Spanish historian, quoted by Limborch in his book on page 217, quote, the place of torture in the Spanish Inquisition is generally an underground and very dark room to which one enters through several doors. No, just not just one door, several doors. See, they don't want Rome doesn't want anybody to hear the shrieks and the cries. There is a tribunal erected in it, that is, three judges, Roman Catholic priests, papists to be sure. There is a tribunal erected in it in which the inquisitor, inspector, and secretary sit. There's your tribunal. When the candles are lighted, yes, Rome always has to light candles. When the candles are lighted and the person to be tortured brought in, the executioner who is waiting for him makes an astonishing and dreadful appearance. He's covered all over with a black linen garment down to his feet and tied close to his body. 
His head and face are all concealed with a long black cowl, only two little holes being left in it for him to see through. All this is intended to strike the miserable wretch, that is, God's Bible-believing, God-fearing person who would never bend the knee to the Pope, this miserable wretch with greater terror in mind and body when he sees himself going to be tortured by the hands of one who thus looks like the very devil himself, unquote. The degrees of torture are described by Julius Clarus and other writers quoted by Limbuch in his book. They were various and included the following. Quote, uh, number one, the being threatened to be tortured. That's right, they're threatened you, threaten to torture you. You know, the United States government thinks it's okay to torture people. Waterboard, what, and they, don't, they haven't told us all the means of torture that they use against the quote-unquote heretics. But first, they start out by threatening to torture. See, Rome likes to prolong the enjoyment of killing God's people just as long as they possibly can. So we start with threatening them with torture. Number two, then being carried to the place of torture. Three, the stripping and binding. Yeah, you know they're serious when they strip all your clothes off and they bind your hands and feet and plug your mouth with a rag so nobody can hear your your streaks. Number four, the being hoisted up on the rack. You know what the rack was? Well, they wrap cables around your feet and around your arms and then stretched you until your back broke. Number five, what they called squassation. This was the torture of the pulley. That's right, a pulley. Besides this, there was the torture of the fire or chafing dish full of burning charcoal applied to the soles of the feet. Then there was the torture of the rack and the other instrument called by the Spaniards estalero. Then that of pouring water into a bag of linen stuffed down the throat. We call that waterboarding today. Look. If somebody stuffs a rag in your mouth, pins your tongue to the bottom of your mouth, and stuffs your mouth with a rag so that you can't close your mouth, you can't scream, you can't even breathe through your mouth, and then they start to pour water in the rag slowly at first, and the water finally soaks up the rag and begins to drip down the back of your throat, and you can't move your tongue, where does the water go? Right in your lungs. And you literally drown right there on the table. It's called waterboarding. Our government thinks it's a wonderful way to coerce the heretics to give up, to confess their sins. The United States government uses water and a rag stuffed down your throat to make you confess. Kind of sounds like the Inquisition, doesn't it? That's because it is. He says, then that of pouring water into a bag of linen stuffed down the throat, and then that of iron dice forced into the feet by screws, and of canes, placed crossways between the fingers and so compressed as to produce intolerable pain. Then the torture of cords drawn tightly around various parts of the body, cutting through the flesh. That's right. Twist a a cord around your arm or your leg or your private parts and twisting them until the cord cuts through the flesh. Ingenious engines of torture developed scientifically by the Holy Office of the Inquisition 
to make death pleasurable. Cutting through the flesh and of the machine in which the sufferer was fixed head downwards and lastly the torture of red hot irons applied to the breasts and sides until they burned to the bone. And if you're tempted to say, listen to Tom, he's a fear monger, you better stop and realize this is reality. This is not fear mongering. This is 1,500 years of history. History that you never heard about from your school, you never heard in the mainstream media, you never heard in the churches. And it's real history. And it's about to repeat itself. Because you know what? We believe in a future Antichrist that hasn't come yet. A future Antichrist that we'll never see and will be raptured up out of the way before he ever persecutes any of us. Well, he's been persecuting God's people for 1,500 years. And if you think you're an exception to that, you have misled yourself. Lastly, the torture of red-hot irons applied to the breasts. Yes, to the breasts of women, tender women, even tender women. See, Rome has no compassion for a heretic. If you won't bend your knee to the Pope, if you rebel against the government that the papacy has established to govern your country, If you rebel against that popish government called the United States government, they can torture you. Yes, according to the Patriot Act, they can torture you. They can come into your house just exactly like the Holy Office of the Inquisition did 500 years ago, They can come into your house unannounced at 3 o'clock in the morning, bust down the door, take you, your wife, and your children, separate you from your wife and your children from their mother, take the children off to a convent now called a reorientation center, and separate the man from the wife, keep you without charge, indefinitely question you and interrogate you without an attorney no attorney see in the country before the new world order you you had a right to an attorney that's a protestant tenet see protestantism is gone see we gave up we believed in a future antichrist not the real antichrist so now the papacy's exonerated, and he can do whatever he wants to do, say now. So we, uh, we have the, the, uh, the uh, Patriot Act that allows our government, our popish government, to roust us out of bed 3 o'clock in the morning, not charge us, hold us indefinitely, in, inquisitor, uh, you know, inquest, hold an inquest, interrogate us, and then torture us and kill us if they want to. But all I have to do is call you a domestic terrorist. You don't agree with the popish government of the United States. You won't bend the knee to the papacy or obey his laws because Jesus is your king and the Bible is your law and the world is his inheritance. But you can't serve two masters. You either serve Christ or you serve Antichrist. And if you serve Antichrist, you're subject to his punishments. See, Jesus Christ gave us liberty. He gave us forgiveness of our sins and a promise of eternal bliss in his very presence. But the Antichrist loves judgment and torture and condemnation and execution 
No forgiveness for sins for the by the papacy. The only thing he will accept is recantation. You get on your knees and you kiss his ring and you obey his laws and you do whatever he tells you to do, even so far as to call black, white, and white, black. To call the Antichrist the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God. That's what he wants. He wants you to bend the knee and worship him as though he were Christ because he claims to be Christ and always has. They want you to sin against your own Messiah. And if you don't, they have every right. If you're a subject to the Pope, you they have every right to torture you. Here on page 219 is the account of the stripping of victims, men and women, preparatory to torture. The stripping from them of every vestige of clothing by these holy inquisitors and how they put on them short linen drawers, leaving all the rest of the body naked for the free action of the tormentors. Here on page 221 is the account by Isaac Orobio of what he suffered when in their hands. It was towards evening, he says, when he was brought to the place of torture in the Inquisition. It was a large underground room, arched, and the walls covered with black hangings. The candlesticks were fastened to the wall, and the whole room enlightened with candles placed in them. At one end of it, there was an enclosed place called, or or like a closet, where the Inquisitor and the notary sat at a table, so that the place seemed to him as the very mansion of death, everything appearing so terrible and awful. Then the inquisitor admonished him to confess the truth before his torments began. When he answered that he had told the truth, the inquisitor gravely protested that since he was so obstinate as to suffer the torture, the holy office would be innocent. That's right. When they torture you, they're going to claim innocence because of your your obstinance. You're the one who's causing your own torture. What exquisite hypocrisy. He said the holy office would be innocent if he should even expire, that is, die in his torments. When he, said, when he had said this, they put a linen garment over his body and drew it so very close to each side as almost to squeeze him to death. When he was almost dying, they slackened all at once the sides of the garment, and after that he began to breathe again. The sudden alteration put him to the most grievous and ang- of anguish and pain. You remember... Can you imagine being squeezed so tightly that you can't breathe and you're about to expire because you can't breathe? And then all of a sudden, in an instant, they let loose the pressure from the garment that was squeezing you to death. The pain is unbelievable. It said, when he had overcome this torture, the same admonition was repeated, that he would confess the truth in order to prevent further torment. As he persisted in his denial, they they tied his thumb so very tight with small cords as made the extremities of them greatly swell and caused the blood to spurt out from under his nails. Can you imagine somebody wrapping a cord around your thumb so tight that the meat pops out the end? That's all fun and games for the Inquisition. That's all fun and games for the government of the United States of America. He says, after this, he was placed with his back against a wall and fixed upon a bench. Into the wall were fastened iron pulleys. 
through which there were ropes drawn and tied around his arms and legs in several places. The executioner, drawing these ropes with great violence, fastened his body with them to the wall, his arms and legs, and especially his fingers and toes being bound so tightly as to put him to the most exquisite pain so that it seemed to him just as though he was dissolving in flames. Now, this is real testimony from a man who escaped the Inquisition, Isaac Arobio. He says, after this, a new kind of torture succeeded. There was an instrument like a small ladder made of two upright pieces of wood and five cross ones sharpened in the front. This the torturer placed over against him and by a single motion struck it with great violence against his, both of his shins so that he received upon each of them at least at, at once five violent strokes which put him to such intolerable anguish that he fainted away. After this, he came to himself, and they inflicted on him a further torture. The torturer tied ropes around Arobio's wrists and then put these ropes about his own back, which was covered with leather to prevent him from hurting himself. How merciful. Then falling backwards, he drew the ropes with all his might until they cut through Arobio's flesh, even to the very bones. And this torture was repeated twice, the ropes being tied about his arms and at the, at the distance of two fingers' breadth from the former wound and drawn with the same violence. On this, the physician and the surgeon were sent for out of the neighboring, out of the neighboring apartment to ask whether the torture could be continued without danger of death. As, they were, as there was a prospect of his living through it, the torture was then repeated, after which he was bound up in his own clothes and carried back to his prison. Here, opposite to this recital, is a picture representing these various tortures. After prolonged imprisonment, Arobio was released and banished from the kingdom of Seville. Now, the author doesn't go into what circumstances led to Arobio's release. But let me tell you, there is a Bible scripture that applies directly to the Inquisition. They opened not the house of the prison. Those of you who are familiar with your Bible and can memorize book, chapter, and verses can tell me and the rest of the listeners, precisely where this is written. And I believe it's in Isaiah chapter 14. Read it for yourself. Read the whole chapter, Isaiah chapter 14. He says, before we let fall the curtain upon this awful subject, the holy office of the Inquisition, let us listen for a moment to some of the words of William Lithgow, a Scotsman, who suffered the tortures of the Inquisition in the time of James I, King James I of England. After telling of the diabolical treatment he received, which was very similar to that I was just describing, says this, quote, Now mine eyes did begin to startle, my mouth to foam and froth, and my teeth to chatter like the gobbling of drumsticks. Oh, strange, inhuman, monster man-manglers. Monster man-manglers. That's what he called the inquisitors of Rome. And notwithstanding of my shivering lips and this fiery passion, my vehement groaning, and blood springing from my arms, my broken sinews, yea, and my depending my depending weight on flesh-cutting cords, yet they struck me on the face with cudgels to abate and cease the thundering noise of my wrestling voice. That's right. When you're being tortured, you don't even have the right to scream in agony. 
At last being released from these pinnacles of pain, I was hand fast set on the floor with this, their ceaseless imploration. Confess, confess, confess in time or thine inevitable torments ensue. That's right. You either confess now or we're going to continue with these tortures. Where finding nothing from me but still innocence. Quote, oh, I am innocent. Oh, Jesus, the Lamb of God, have mercy on me and strengthen me with patience to undergo this barbarous murder. Unquote. That's real live testimony from a man who escaped the holy office. Henry Grattan Guinness says, enough. Here, let the curtain drop. I should sicken you were I to pursue the subject further. It's too horrible, too damnable. This is where I depart from Henry Grattan Guinness. If you're having trouble comprehending that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, then you need to read more accounts of the tortures of Rome. And I highly recommend that if Romanism in the Reformation is too strong medicine for some family members or some friends that you have, and you're afraid that they won't comprehend this book, then I recommend Lynn Borch's History of the Inquisition or Fox's Book of Martyrs or any Protestant work that circumspectly reveals the history of the Roman Catholic Church and the Holy Office of the Inquisition. It's out there. Those who seek will find You feel like you have an obligation to your fellow man, your family, your friends to get their truth in your hand, in their hands. And if you think Romanism and the Reformation might not be the right book, there's a whole library of Protestant books that would prepare someone to really comprehend Romanism and the Reformation. It's up to you. Henry Grattan Guinness continues, here in this paper, I have some of the ashes of the martyrs, some of their burned bones. Remember, this is a lecture. Henry Grattan Guinness brought books with him, lots of books with him. He brought other show-and-tell items of the tortures of Rome, and he carried a little bag full of ashes of one of the martyrs of Jesus. He says, I have bits of rusted iron and melted lead, which I took myself from these hands, with these hands. He's holding up his hands to the crowd. He took these things himself with his own hands from the Quemadero in Madrid, the place where they burned the martyrs, not far from the Inquisition. It was in the year 1870 that I witnessed it, just before the great ecumenical council was held at Rome, by which the Pope was proclaimed infallible. I was in Spain that spring and visited the newly opened Quamadero. I saw the ashes of the martyrs. I carried away with me some of the relics of that spot, which are now lying upon this table. Hear me, though in truth I scarcely know how to speak upon this subject, I'm almost dumb with horror when I think of it. I have visited the places in Spain, in France, in Italy, most deeply stained and dyed with martyrs' blood. I have visited the valleys of Piedmont. He's talking about the place in the Alps where the Waldenses lived, separate from Rome separated unto Christ who worshiped Jesus and Jesus alone who would never bend the knee to the Pope 
those valleys of Piedmont where the Waldenses' bones lie bleaching in the sun even to this day. Rome led crusade after crusade after crusade against those recalcitrant protestants before Protestantism was even cool. You see, Rome has always persecuted the the saints. It started in the Colosseums under the pagan Roman Empire, and it continued under the Holy Roman Empire. Nothing changed. They just started calling it holy. He says, I visited the Valley of Piedmont. I've stood in the shadow of the great cathedral of Seville on the spot where they burned the martyrs or tore them limb from limb. I have stood breast deep. Listen, I have stood breast deep in the ashes of the martyrs of Madrid. I have read the story of Rome's deeds. I have waded through the many volumes of history and of martyrology. I have visited either in travel or in thought scenes too numerous for me to name where the saints of God have been slaughtered by papal Rome, the great butcher of bodies and of souls. I cannot tell you what I've seen, what I have read, what I've thought. I cannot tell you what I feel. Oh, it's a bloody tale. I have stood in that valley of Lucerna, where dwelt the faithful Waldenses, those ancient Protestants who held to the pure gospel of Jesus Christ all throughout the dark ages. That lovely valley with its pine-clad slopes, which Rome converted into a slaughterhouse. Oh, horrible massacres of gentle, unoffending, noble-minded men, women, and children. Oh, horrible massacres of tender women and helpless children. Yes, ye hated them. Ye hunted them. Ye trapped them. Ye tortured them. Ye stabbed them. Ye stuck them on spits. You impaled them. You hanged them. You roasted them. You flayed them. You know what flaying is? They literally cut all the hide off your body just like you were a deer in the timber. They cut you to pieces. That's what they did to them. They hung them up and cut their hide off. You roasted them. You flayed them. You cut them in pieces. You violated them. That is, raped them, men, women, and children. You violated the women. That's rape. You violated the children. That's pedophilia. What is so common among the Roman Catholic priesthood today? Pedophilia. Nothing's changed. And you dare to say that the Pope is the spiritual leader of the world, the head of the Christian church? That you ought to ecumenically reunite with him and obey his laws? What do you do to the blood of the martyrs of Jesus when you join an ecumenical church? Don't you spit in their face? Did they all die in vain? Or will Jesus recompense every drop of their blood? You know, just as righteous Abel's blood cried from the ground, so does their blood still cry for justice from the ground to heaven, and God hears every whimper. And he's going to avenge them all. Where will that put you if you are a member of one of the ecumenical churches that believes in a future Antichrist and has exonerated the papacy and is now going to unite all, quote-unquote, Christians 
under his sole leadership. He says you forced flints into them and stakes and stuffed them with gunpowder and blew them up and tore them asunder limb from limb and tossed them over precipices and dashed them against the rocks. Ye cut them up alive. Ye dismembered them. Ye racked, mutilated, burned, tortured, mangled, massacred, holy men, sainted women, mothers, daughters, and tender children, harmless babes, hundreds, thousands, thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions. Ye sacrificed them in heaps, in hecatombs, turning all of Spain, Italy, France, Europe, Christian Europe, into a slaughterhouse, a charnel house, an an acaldama. Oh, horrible, too horrible to think of. The sight dims, the heart sickens, the soul is stunned to the presence of the awful spectacle. A harlot, oh harlot, gilded harlot with brazen brow and brazen heart. Red are thy garments, red thine hands. Thy name is written in this book. God has written it. The world has read it. Thou art a murderess, O Rome. Thou art the murderous Babylon, Babylon the great, drunken, foully drunken, yea, drunken with the sacred blood which thou hast shed in streams and torrents, the blood of saints, the blood of martyrs of Jesus. Were there nothing else by which to recompense thee, O persecuting church of Rome, this dreadful mark would identify thee. Did you hear what Henry Gratton Guinness said? If you don't know anything else about the papacy or the Roman Catholic Church or any of its history, if all you know about is the inquisitions of Rome and how they tortured God's people, that's all it would take, says this author, this author to positively, unmistakably, incontestably, identify the papacy as the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Bible. That's all they need to know. The story of the Inquisition. And they've convinced us it's over. And all Christians believe why the Inquisitions are over. That was hundreds of years ago. Rome's more civilized now. She wouldn't think of killing God's people. And all at the same time, The military of the United States of America is going on crusade after crusade after crusade after crusade, killing anyone, any nation who won't bend the knee to Rome and worship the papacy in this new world order. You say the United States is the greatest country that ever was. I'm telling you that it is the most wicked nation in world history. Why? Because just like Israel, it knew the truth. It had the truth. It saw the Shekinah glory of God. It was delivered from the bondage of Egyptian slavery, baptized in their Protestant Reformation through the Red Sea, provided for and protected by God, who lit the night with the Shekinah glory and who covered them from the heat of the sun by day with that same Shekinah glory, and then who murmured against Moses and wanted to go back to Pharaoh. That's your ecumenical movement. The Protestant Reformation was your deliverance. 
and now we're murmuring against our Moses, Luther, Cranmer, Ridley, Latimer, Tyndale, all the Protestant reformers, the Waldenses, the Huguenots, the Hussites, the first century Christians who died in pagan Rome at the Colosseums would murmur against them all. Joining ecumenical churches and wanting to unite, quote unquote, all Christianity in a one world government, a one world religion, a one world economic system, a one world social system, all headed up by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. Henry Grattan Guinness says, This is thy brand. By this we know thee. Thou art that foretold Babylon. We know thee by thy place. We know thee by thy proud assumptions, by the throne on which thou sittest, by those seven hills, by the beast thou ridest, by the garments thou and the they wearest, purple and scarlet, by the cup thou bearest, the Eucharist, by the name emblazoned on thy forehead, by thy kingly paramours, by thy shameless looks, by thy polluted deeds, but, oh, chiefly by this, by thy prolonged and dreadful persecution of the saints, by those massacres, by the inquisition, by the fires of that burning stake, mark how its ruddy flames ascend and see its accursed smoke go up into heaven. And I'm telling you, it carries with it the, the, the prayers of the saints and the real Christ is going to come down from heaven and recompense it all. And I wouldn't want to be within a country mile of a Christian church today because they don't have the guts to tell the truth. 